Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we're doing an early impression on a very rare, hard to find, extremely expensive, highly sought after, uh, any adjective you can throw at it. You know, this is, um, you know, kind of a mountaintop experience for a fraghead, if you will. Uh, it's from the house of Ensar Oud, and it's called EO Number One. Now, this is thanks to a very good friend of the channel. His name's Eddie. Uh, he goes by the username Jonathan B. Swift. And um, if you have watched some of my other NSAR reviews, I basically did three NSAR reviews so far. I did EO number one Assam, which came out in 2022. This is the original EO number one, which I've been hunting for a long time. This one came out in 2018. Uh, I also did EO number two, and I did Jungle Kinam by Ensar Oud. You can go check those reviews out. Uh, and two of them came from a good friend, uh, Nissan, who goes by Kafka Zip, I believe. Um, I can't remember his exact username, but it's something like that. But Nissan, thank you for the two that you sent me. And EO number two came from Eddie. And now EO number one comes from Eddie. So a big thank you. I wouldn't be able to talk about these without the generosity and kindness of people like you, Eddie. So thank you very much, sir. Um, okay, so let me tell you about my day. I'm in a tie, in a in a in a um, suit, if you will, because uh, my wife dragged me to church. She then dragged me to the mall. Uh, it's freezing outside, literally. It's right on the cusp of freezing. It's either just above freezing or just below freezing. Last time I checked, it's right there, uh, around around freezing. And uh, it's the end of January, so it's what you expect, but it's Texas. I mean, Texas weather is kind of all over the place. So my companion today, what kept me entertained while walking through the mall for hours on end and uh, at church was EO number one. And let me tell you something. I have been, if you go watch my reviews of, um, you know, NSAR, you know that my basic feeling on the house is I always kind of say the same thing, and it's that... Um, I enjoy what I'm smelling. I like what I'm smelling. I just don't know if I like it enough to spend five hundred to a thousand dollars like it. You know what I mean? Uh, that's the short, short version of my NSAR reviews normally. However, there is one I have not done a full video on yet, or I, I don't believe I've done a full video on it yet, and it's called Tiger Lust. And Tiger Lust might be my favorite of all of the NSARs. Um. And so far, I've yet to find one to measure up to Tiger Lust, and I've been waiting to do a video on Tiger Lust because um, Tiger Lust, um, Tiger Lust kind of fulfills my need. It fulfills my addiction for more. I always want more with and with uh, perfumes. I want more oud, more castoria, more civet, more animalics, more resins, more everything. Right? That's just my personality. I'm a lot like Russian Adam in that sense. Tiger Lust delivers. Many of the other NSARs that I smelled, EO number two, um, you know, EO number two I thought was a really nice musk. I really liked the real deer musk in EO number two, but uh, I did not like it as much as, let's say, uh, Ariz Lodore's Siberian musk, so I would not be getting a bottle of EO number two. Uh, Jungle Kinam, go watch my review on Jungle Kinam. It's probably my favorite Kinam fragrance I've smelled. Kinam, there's a whole backstory behind Kinam, which I think I go into in that Jungle Kinam review, if you will. Uh, I really enjoyed Jungle Kinam, but same thing. It's, um, you know, uh, Kinam has this softness to it. You know, this, um, it has this, this it, unlike animalic ouds, it doesn't have the animalic facet, and I yearn for that animalic facet. And everyone says, oh, you know, but um, the non-animalic ouds can be the higher qu quality ouds, and that's fine, you know, to each their own. But uh, for me, go watch my review on Jungle Kinam if you're if you're interested in learning more about what Kinam is and kind of going from there. And so that was kind of the same thing. I enjoyed it, but I don't think I'd be spending the kind of money that they're asking for for it. Uh, and then finally, there was number one, Assam, which was a almost like a flanker of number one. And uh, everyone kept telling me, oh, you know, if you just try the original, you'll love it. And it's more your style. Assam is maybe a little bit of a departure from what you really like, Ramsey. You have to try just EO number one. So are they right? Do I love the regular EO number one? 
So let's talk about it. Um, let me kind of read you the blurb because I love, you guys know I love reading blurbs. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about my uh, take on it, my journey with the fragrance. So here's what Ensar Oud says about EO number one. It says, Leather and Oud go together like a king and crown. And there is no sweeter spot between the rustic allure of Ensar's artisanal, often mad, Oud world and popular perfumery than this Oudalicious addition to the queer tradition. A rugged aroma that makes you wonder if Hemingway just lit up a Cuban or if Churchill's in town. After 15 fragrant years, I'm finally taking off my jungle jacket for a tie, eh? To dive headfirst into my debut spray perfume. And I approach perfume the way I do oud distillation. That's why number one is, comp is composed of the rarest, most expensive ingredients in all of perfumery, including copious amounts of aged Manipur oud. Now, I'm going to stop here real quick because one thing that you must know about me is my heart is in vintage perfume. So I love vintages. I'll show you a couple of vintages from my collection that, you know, I think can be compared to what EO1 is kind of doing. Um, but you know, I'm not an oud head in, in the sense that I couldn't tell you the differences between green versus black kinam or, you know, Manipur oud versus Cambodian oud versus, uh, Assam oud, you know, maybe a very high level, but, uh, I, I'm not the type of person that's going to be able to go in there and say, you know, oh, this is the special oud that smells like strawberry fruit loops. No, that's, that's not me. Okay. So just keep that in mind. I'm, I love oud, but I'm not into oud in the way some people are. I don't own tolas of individual ouds or anything like that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Not only is this the highest quality oud fragrance that has ever been produced in spray format, the entire composition is infused into a high concentration, genuine raw ambergris tincture instead of just plain ethanol. Similar tinctures of this kind sell for around 400 Euro pounds or euros for 30 mils. Here, it's already included. I'll go through the notes in just a second. I've literally been called stupid for insisting to use such olfactory gems in a perfume. In fact, most critics advocate using synthetics exclusively, and I see their point. Why sacrifice rare rose and oud instead of synthetics that are a hundred times cheaper? Not to mention... This is a staple argument. You never have to worry about reproducing the scent, i.e. it is scalable. You can sell a lot more. I insist on these insanities because to me and people like me, there is a difference. You smell low-grade or lab-made oud, a.k.a. the oud note, and all you can do is laugh at how it's being compared to real high-caliber oud. Most can't even tell, but to any oud novice, the difference is red and blue. To any oud novice... Uh, I wonder if they meant expert. Maybe he did mean novice, that even a novice can see the difference between, um, you know, norlimbanol and real oud. You'll exude wafts of a tobacco-heavy, old-school leather jacket aroma with an unmistakable Don Cor Corleone, kiss my hand, campagno esteem. Kiss the ring. Subtle but not soft, with a base that's all oud in vintage horse saddle leather. I soaked up the feedback and we received after number one's launch and improved where folks felt it could be better, rounded off some edges felt were a bit rough, and introduced a couple of new ingredients to the ensemble that add tenacity, tenacity and longevity. And a few tweaks to this new pure perfume edition makes it even headier. The result is a stronger composition that lingers longer but doesn't overstay, louder siage with a gentleman's discretion. No doubt, number one is not your typical extra de parfum. It's not supposed to be. I wouldn't dream of topping the master queers that came before, nor do I subscribe to modern industry standards of how long, how loud, and how far. This is an indie queer that's limited and niche, where I simply wanted to add an oud-inspired rendition to the legacy of queer de Russie, etc., etc., and offer perfume lovers the chance to experience just how amazing and, and exalting a fixative artisanal oud can be. In EO number one, you pass third base to smell oud and leather drunk and in love. In a perfume that's a first in a vibrant queer heritage that's been turning top hats and making hearts melt 
for decades. Okay, so that's the blurb. Good blurb, not bad. Not great, but not bad, uh, as far as the blurb goes, okay? Let me read you the notes. This is directly off of the NSAR website, and then we'll talk about a couple things. So, top notes are rosewood, lavender, siam wood, nutmeg, and castorium. Very important, castorium. Heart notes, Himalayan, Turkish, French, and Edward rose. Four types of roses listed. And I think there's also some Taif rose in here. Even though it's not listed, I get this lemony tea-like quality, which we'll talk about later, that I think is probably Taif rose. But may, that's just my take. Uh, Jasmine, Tolu Balsam, Civet. So we got Animalix in the top with Castorium, Animalix in the heart with Civet. Base of Wild Aged Manipur Oud. Ambergris, vintage papau and sandalwood, tobacco, vanilla, tree moss, and Ethiopian frankincense. Beautiful note listing, okay? Now, if you guys know me, you know that leather is my favorite note of all time. So, I figured this was going to be an easy sell for me, right? That I would love EO number one. And guess what? I was right. I, I absolutely do love EO number one. Um, to me, this fragrance opens up smelling basically like a salty leather, is what it smells like. It smells like a salty leather, and a very high quality salty leather, um, supported by oud. That's kind of the, you know, if you wanted just a high level, Ramsey, what does the fragrance smell like? Salty leather supported by oud. Rose oud. Um, and the oud is animalic, but more to act uh, in a way that seems to put this... Um, leather in like this pincher movement you know imagine the leathers in the middle and on one side you've got this salty ambergris that seems to appear right from the beginning you get it and on the other side you get the oud and it traps the leather in this pincher movement right that's how the opening feels to me now one thing i should mention is from the sample uh that eddie sent to me I don't know if this is uh, EO number one EDP or if it's EO number one Pure Parfum. I mean, the ambergris tincture feel makes me think it's the Pure Parfum, but honestly, I, I don't know with 100% certainty. So that is something that'll have to be a little bit of a question mark unless Eddie can um, answer that question. Excuse me, Eddie, if you leave a comment, I'll uh, pin it to the top of the video. Um, so, the um, salty ambergris note from the very beginning smells extremely high quality, as you would expect with a fragrance of this price tag. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty expensive fragrance to buy in Pure Parfum. I think it's a thousand bucks for 50 mil, if I'm not mistaken, um, or $999 or something for 50 mils. Um, I think the Eau de Parfum is 500 bucks, maybe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for 50 mils, but um, it does last forever. I will tell you that. And um, there's a lot of change in this fragrance. So the opening has this classy mix of lavender and a slight spice. Okay, so along with that leather, you get this old school vintage lavender, like uh, the masculines of days gone by. And yesterday, I actually uh, unboxed a Arige La Dore perfume. And it is antiquity. I love this stuff. I'm so happy to have a bottle. This also is courtesy of Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, I did pay him for this, but he could have really put my feet to the fire, and he did not. Uh, he's class all around. And so it's a partial bottle, but enough for, for me to love and enjoy. And the reason that I bring up antiquity is not because the two fragrances smell alike, but because... This idea of um, an indie, you know, house like uh, Ensar looking back in time to vintage fragrances of the past and kind of making their version, EO number one for me is probably the most vintage smelling fragrance that I've smelled from him so far out of the four that I've talked about. EO number one, Assam, EO number two, Jungle Kinam, and then of course Tiger Lust. EO number one, just the original, is probably the most traditionally classic masculine fragrance. So they mentioned a couple fragrances um, uh, in the little blurb. 
one of the fragrances that they actually mentioned by name, and they didn't mention the brand, but they did say this type of fragrance was Queer de Russi. And Queer de Russi by Chanel. Um, this is a vintage 80s bottle. This is probably, um, I actually did a top 100 countdown. Yes, a top 100. Um, it's on my channel. And this made the top 10 uh, of my all-time favorite fragrances. So, Queer de Russi, this is an, again, this is an 80s eau de toilette. The eau de toilette is discontinued. They don't make the eau de toilette anymore. My, my God, man. You know, and actually, that salty leather vibe uh, follows through a little bit with, with Queer de Russi. Now, one thing you don't get is you don't get the, um, you know, the Chanel style florals, of course, in EO number one. Of course, Queer de Russi doesn't have oud. Um, there isn't that birch that really makes it a true Russian leather with EO number one, but it kind of gets you in the ballpark, right? If you like something like uh, Chanel's Queer de Russie or even sticking with Chanel, um, you know, that, that note listing, I, I kind of put my finger up and mentioned Castorium in the top. So if you like something like this, Antaeus by Chanel from 1981, Probably my favorite fragrance of all time. This and Bellamy, I think, go back and forth. When I did my top 100, uh, I put Bellamy as my favorite fragrance of all time by Hermes. And, you know, there is a little bit um, of indecision on my favorite fragrances. Or, it you know, it ch it's obviously a, an evolving list. But one thing that usually never changes is the top three. It's Bellamy, Koros, and Antaeus. Somewhere in that order. Maybe next month, Koros will be number one. Right now, I honestly think I would probably put Bellamy two, and I would stick just Antaeus number one. Um, if you can find these older bottles that have a silver atomizer, go for it. You know, if you can then find an older bottle that this is all silver, um, you, the top, then it's even older than this bottle. But this is great. I mean, I've got one of those older bottles. They're, they're all amazing. Um... Chanel doesn't do bad reformulations, but the new one with the black atomizer has lost a little bit of its touch, I would say. Uh, the castorium's been toned down a bit. If you want that animalic castorium, hairy chest, you know, gold chain, hair hanging out over your shirt, 80s masculine feel, go for the older, um, you know, atomizer. But the reason I bring this up, I love Antaeus. Love, love. It's I feel so at home with Antaeus and Bellamy. I actually had to go to Houston on work last week, uh, and one of the three days that I was there, I wore Bellamy as my scent of the day, one of those days, and I actually got a compliment out of the blue from somebody. Um, so, and, but interesting, it was very interesting because most people would be shocked I would wear something as harsh and strong as Bellamy, but that's my character, that's who I am, that's the kind of stuff I, I prefer to wear. And if that's your character as well, these type of fragrances we're going to talk about today, uh, should definitely be on your to sniff list if you've never smelled them. Now, the reason that I mentioned Antaeus is because of that castorium in the top. And for me, um, the nutmeg adds this slight spice, and nutmeg does this thing that I've come to expect from nutmeg, and that it keeps everything in its place. Nutmeg is like the referee. It makes sure there's no fouls. It makes sure there's nothing going out of bounds. It kind of keeps everything in a nice little area, you know, make sure the ball stays in play. It's got the whistle, and it puts a little bow on top, right? Tells you when the game's over. Nutmeg does that. The spiciness of nutmeg does that to my nose. And um, as it dries, um, what ends up happening as, you know, what, from the time you spray, the salty leather vibe dominates for about half an hour to 45 minutes. Half an hour to 45 minutes in, you're going to start to notice a fragrance that begins to smell more like a traditional rose oud, Okay. And so that traditional rose oud begins to kind of bloom. And um, what ends up happening is it starts to fight for control of the steering wheel with the leather. All right. So the leather is driving the car for the first 30 to 45 minutes. After that, the rose oud kind of begins to uh, gain in strength and prominence. And it begins to feel like it's the one now driving the car. So... Here's what I think is happening. I think that this beautifully leathery castorium in EO number one, and obviously this is not the bottle, this is just a little decant. I wish I had a bottle, it's a gorgeous bottle. It's got that leather pouch that it comes in and 
to add to the quality of the work that NSAR does, you know, the leather that's actually um, made that if you ever see a bottle and it has that leather pouch that the bottle sits in, the person that hand makes the leather also hand makes the um, leather that goes around the outside of like the Pope's Bible and stuff like that. He does work for the Pope uh, in the Vatican, just to give you an idea of the quality of the type of work that you're getting. Uh, beautiful. I would love a bottle, but they're very expensive. I learned that whenever I uh, got this little decant of Tiger Lust, this was also given to me by someone in the community, by the way. Um, I bought something else from them and they threw this in as a thank you for buying, which um, just goes to show the kindness of the community. You know, that's one thing that has really shocked me since I've started this channel is the generosity and the kindness, the outpouring of um, thanks from people, you know, for you know, they say for the time and doing these videos and all. I enjoy doing them, but I was not expecting that at all. That's one thing that really kind of shocked me is the kindness from your fellow man, right? So someone sent me that. And whenever I saw, whenever I got my nose on this for the first time, I was like, shit, I need a bottle of Le of Tiger Lust. Like this is, this is um, full bottle worthy. And I went to go buy a bottle and I saw the price and I was like, whoa, okay. So it is expensive. Obviously the price is probably one of the biggest drawbacks with this brand with Ensar Oud, uh, but we'll talk about some of that later. But the castorium, what it feels like in the beginning is I think this castorium gives off this leathery effect. And this, I have to admit, you know, I have been harsh on some Ensar fragrances in the past. For me, the leather in EO number one, that castorium leather creation goes in the hall of fame of castorium leathers for me. This is right up there with my favorite type of leathery castorium. This is a leathery castorium fragrance. Um, if you want to smell an amazing castorium in modern terms, check out my friend Eugene's brand, Les Abstraits. He has a perfume called uh, La Dule Exquise, and it's a rose uh, patchouli, but the castorium Antoine Lee uses in there is mind-blowing. The best modern castorium I've ever smelled. Um, this is probably the best vintage castorium I've ever smelled in Antaeus. And this is one of the best niche or indie castoriums I've ever smelled. EO number one is fantastic. Um, and, you know, it's, um, I think if you're into this type of perfume, it, it really is a, a must sniff. So what I think keeps my attention brilliantly as far as like how the fragrance dries and what ends up happening is of course the quality of the materials i've mentioned that before here they really do smell of the highest quality it really smells like you're getting something uh extremely special you know a collector's item perfume for a person who loves fragrance you know it's it's not for just someone that's going to the mall uh and sniffing out a perfume this is for the true frag head in in my opinion um and one thing that I notice, at least to my nose, is the transitions. The transitions are smooth. I mean, I'm thinking like S-Class Mercedes goes to, you know, 11th gear. You don't even feel a thing, right? Um, and you're probably sitting in a lovely leather seat in the meantime. Uh, that's kind of the smoothness of the transitions. But there are transitions. That's the biggest thing. It's not linear. There are transitions. And the transitions are between some of my favorite notes of all time. That's that's the other thing, is you're talking about um, switching between notes and accords and then back again of my favorites, right? So I think this perfume, um, honestly, I think this perfume should have been called EO0 instead of EO1 because to my nose, the fragrance makes a big circle with its transition. It starts with this salty leather, it goes through phases and it actually ends up back with a leather uh, finish. Um, and so uh, I think it should have been called EO0 because of that, because it does have this circular, this infinity, it goes around, you could you know go around the roundabout forever with this fragrance. It has this completeness to it, if you will. Um, excuse me, I'm just gonna grab a sip of water here. Pardon me. All right. Excuse me whilst I hydrate. Okay. So. Um, so it begins with this salty ambergris with leather, which 
you know, I think is probably the castorium. When you first spray, you're probably getting that castorium from the very beginning. Castorium can have this slightly metallic um, warmth to it, you know. There's this warmth to the leather. Um, almost like you're smelling the live animal that it was before um, it, it turned into a piece of leather, right? And um, so um, it transitions from that leather, like I said, to this rose oud. And that's where it brings in the introduction of animalic note number two, around the one hour mark. And animalic note number two is civet. And you guys know I love civet. I love all animalic notes. Actually, I'm a sucker for animalic notes. Anything animalic, I'm a fan of. Uh, civet, castorium, oud, hyrax, ambergris, musk, you name it, it's animalic. I love it, right? So here they introduce civet. And it's in the heart stage where you're going to start to get an accord not listed, a note or an accord that is not listed. And I mentioned it earlier, it's T. So, um, you know, in that note listing I read you, rosewood, lavender, Siam wood, nutmeg, castorium, Himalayan, Turkish, French, and Edward rose, jasmine, tolu balsam, civet, wild aged manipur, oud, ambergris, vintage papau and sandalwood, tobacco, vanilla, tree moss, and Ethiopian frankincense. There's no T listed. But I get a distinct T accord between probably hours, you know, one to two and a half, let's say, or maybe even three. A couple hours in the mid there, there is this um, lemony tea-like vibe. And that's what makes me think maybe it's the Taif Rose uh, that gives off this maybe tea-like vibe or some combination of the Tolu Balsam and, and the other notes. I don't know what it is, but... Um, there's definitely this uh, T accord, which isn't listed in the notes. And I know there are some, uh, I know there's some rose types that give off the, the, the T-like note. And honestly, I couldn't say if it's Himalayan, Turkish, French, or Ed, if it's, you know, Edward Rose that gives that off. But I'm thinking there's maybe a little more that's not actually listed here. So um, it is interesting, though, reading the blurb, if you notice, they mentioned um, Winston Churchill. And um, so uh, Winston Churchill will bring up images in your head, probably of like a classic Victorian, you know, English gentleman of the days gone past. And um, those kind of compositions, those vintage compositions really do speak to my heart. And this has that. It has that. Um, it's so good. I mean, it has this um, vintage old school masculine bit to it, but also this modernity because of this uh, modern indie uh, house profile uh, with the oud. And um, one thing that I do have to say is if you were paying attention to the note listing and you saw Jasmine in the heart, uh, don't let that scare you away. If, if you are, if you hate white florals, if you're not a person that likes white floral compositions, um, this is more, I would say, of this animalic floral mid. So along with the T in the heart, with that rose oud combo as they start to kind of come to the forefront. Oh, God, it's so good. Um, so along with that rose oud combo, you're going to get this animalic floral. And um, the blend or mixture reminds me a bit of the way that they used to do vintage animalic florals in the days gone past. So I'm talking the 80s. In fact, many of the mid to late 80s masculines were animalic floral fragrances. Like I'll give you a couple examples just real quick uh, off the cuff. So if you guys are familiar with this, this is only a tester that I got from Anouj. So Anouj at Enchante Perfume. So I could not, um, I do not have a cap. But uh, just to give you an idea, this is Alain Delon Aquitos, one of the most prized, sought-after, vintage, long-gone masculine fragrances. I have two bottles of this because I love it so much. Uh, this is a tester, so there's no cap, but my God, man. You know, Gerard Anthony just, he just never made a bad fragrance in his life. Everything Gerard Anthony touched was a masterpiece. I think this is so good. The way that the florals blend together into this, you know, oak mossy, green, uh, musky, animalic. There's definitely some civet or something in here. Um, 
it's so, so good though, but, but the florals are extremely prevalent. Uh, the jasmine in particular, you'll really notice here, but it's done in a different way. And the other one that kind of came to mind was maybe something like this. And these are a little obscure fragrances if you're not into vintage masculines, but uh, Paco Rabanne's Tenere. Uh, this is done by Pierre Wagnai, the same perfumer who did my favorite honey fragrance, Boss Number no. 1 from, from the mid-80s. This is a couple years after Boss Number no. 1. And, you know, it just has this um, this decaying, animalic, floral accord um, that would fit perfectly in a, in, a, in a women's fragrance. So what's so crazy about this is you're taking a traditionally masculine opening with castorium, and um, lavender and nutmeg, traditional masculine opening. And you're kind of blending it with this big floral heart. Um, at least five florals that they list, Himalayan, Turkish, French, Edward, Rose, and Jasmine. And I think there's probably more florals that are not listed is my guess. So you kind of get this rose oud vintage floral accord, but it still somehow to my nose stays extremely masculine. It never goes, you know, although I think this would be amazing on a woman. Uh, I think most of the people that you would find um, that are attracted to this would be, would be men, would be my guess, just because of that traditional masculine feel. And then you add the fact there's that vintage feel, that vintage traditional masculine feel, which like I was saying, maybe uh, they were slipping in some feminine touches here and calling it uh, masculine for marketing. Uh, and I actually, I know they were doing that here because uh, Akitos was actually supposed to be Dior's poison. It just missed out. Uh, it was actually the finalist to be uh, Dior's poison. It, it missed out to, uh, to, now Dior poison of course became Dior poison. What it became is exactly how it should have become. But this was in the running for a feminine fragrance, as, as it is, you know. Uh, Alain Delon just saw the brilliance of it and took it and turned it into a masculine fragrance. And so I know there's some uh, gender bending between the, the roles back in the day, and the marketing of perfume can sometimes be just that marketing, but let's say traditionally masculine, if you will, okay? Um, and... Um, then it transitions again, okay? So we talked about a couple transitions already from that salty leather, which I love that salty leather opening, to that rose oud, to that slightly vintage decaying animalic floral, but the oud and the rose stays. So you have to kind of look for that vintage decaying floral a bit, but it's there, you'll get it in the mid, especially hour two to three, which I'm in right now because I re reapplied. And um, uh, then you get more transitions. And finally, if you go back to the blurb, it says, um, you pass third base to smell oud and leather drunk in love. Back from the blurb. You pass third base, as Ensar writes on his website, you will get this um, smoky leather. So that's where this, um, sometimes I think you smell something that smells like smoky leather jacket, right? almost in the uh, idea of like that smoky leather that Tuscan leather brings to you, but this is a different type of leather. Tuscan leather feels like, you know, a bad boy in a pool hall with, uh, you know, stale cigarette smoke in the air. This feels like, um, you know, the corporate lawyer that you see on TV commercials that said, I won these people $685 million, you know, and he's dressed in a $7,000 Armani suit. And, um, you know, he's probably on the millionth floor drinking uh, the most expensive scotch money can buy. Uh, and if he has a leather jacket on, I promise you he didn't get it from Ross or Marshalls. I mean, this feels like you are uh, smelling the highest quality leather. It smells extremely expensive. And sometimes it kind of gives off this... Um, smoky leather jacket. Sometimes it gives off this smoky cigar-like feel. It does have this tobacco note. So there's tea and tobacco in it. The tea in the mid, the tobacco in the base. And that's why I'm saying it, it has this transition because back to the circle, almost like uh, a roundabout, right? It, it kind of transitions back from that rose oud stage 
that decaying floral stage, that animalic floral stage, whatever you want to call it, and it kind of transitions into this um, smoky leather again. So it starts salty leather and kind of finishes smoky, um, smoky leather. Now, there is tree moss listed. So again, another traditionally masculine note. Uh, there is a little bit of vanilla, but just a touch. I mean, I, um, if you don't like sweet fragrances, like I don't like sweet fragrances, because you, you guys know most of the time I do not like sweet fragrances, you will like this, okay? There, there, is, there is no um, cheap, uh, you know, base smell, uh, none of this uh, sweetness that's kind of crept into masculine perfume in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, it's not here at all, right? It's... Um, the vanilla is just a, a, a touch. And I think maybe there's a little bit of musk. I think there's a little bit of maybe real deer musk that's not listed. That's my guess. Um, but again, it's it's not listed in the note listing. I think it's EO2 that focuses on the um, more on the real deer musk than EO number one. So the most unique feature about this, everything that I've said, I hope paints a respectable picture of the fragrance. I hope you kind of have an idea of the journey. And um, to me, um, the most unique fe feature about this entire blend is how it manages to be all these things I mentioned, and yet also manages to stay so wearable. There's something that uh, about this blend that it won't offend. Like, you know, it went to proper uh, elocution school and, you know, it knows exactly how to dress. It holds the door open for people. It's a, it's a respectable fragrance, um, which can be a pro or it can be a con. And this is where I think my personal taste plays into, um, plays into this a little bit. You, you know, you have to understand your own personal taste and what you love and what you don't love. And while I think it's neat, I think it's uh, awesome that I can wear this to work. This could be a signature scent easily. You know, if you're somebody, like I mentioned the high powered attorney. Um, if you're somebody who wears one fragrance every single day and you want to wear some of the, you know, one of the best just signature scent fragrances you can wear as far as like a modern indie fragrance, if you will, you're not into the stuff I'm into, the vintages. I would say EO number one would be an amazing signature scent. Tiger Lust would be too much to be a signature scent. As much as I love it personally, I think it's still my favorite uh, NSAR Oud Tiger Lust. Um, you know, I think it's probably too much to be a signature scent. But EO number one, it really feels like you could wear it to work. You could wear it on a date. You could wear it to court. You could wear it to weddings, anywhere. I mean, there's nothing that I don't think you could throw at this that this would fail in. Um, I would love to see how this works in the heat because it is very cold today. Like I said, it's about freezing, but, um, I think it'll be fine to be honest with you. Um, but however, if, if, if Ensar was sitting across the table from me saying, Ramsey, I'm going to make you a bespoke version of EO number one, I would basically tell him that I want the rough edges put back in. If you read his little blurb, he said that um, he soaked up the feedback and rounded off some edges that he felt were a bit rough. And I would tell him to put those rough edges back in. You know, I want the sharp edges. I wanted the corners. I want the tough, rough, challenging oud, challenging, rough leather. That's why I love Bellamy so much. Is Bellamy is just an unapologetic, um, you know, iris, leather, smoke, wood, uh, you know, it's so 80s, it's just, it's perfect for me. Uh, and same with Antaeus, I mean, Antaeus is uh, all about the castorium, and one of the best castorium uses of all time. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of beeswax in there, and other stuff, of course, that I love, but the castorium is the key. And so I would say, put the rough edges back, I want it to be a little bit more offensive. I want it richer and deeper and darker. And, you know, take the politeness out. Take that EO number one that went to elocution school 
grab him out of there, put him on the streets for a little bit, get him rough, get him rougher, you know, get his hands calloused. Um, it's, he's too polite for me, I think, to be, which is a, um, something that I think you have to kind of know your taste to really be able to say something like that, because this is such a beautiful blend, stunning ingredients. Uh, it's my kind of fragrance through and through, and I can see and appreciate all of it. However, there's just something, you know, he mentions Don Cor Corleone. I, I made the joke about kissing my pinky ring, right? Um, Don, he mentions Don Cor uh, Corleone. I want to see more of the dark side of Don Corleone. To me, EO number one is all Don Corleone, smiling, playing good guy for the camera, you know, um, he, it's the, it's the public Don Corleone. It's the face that Don Corleone puts to the public. I want to see the dark side of Don Corleone. I want to see, I want to smell and hear what goes on in the shadows, right? When the cameras aren't on. Um, but that's my personal taste. You might smell this and go, oh my God, you want the animalics to be heavier? You want the leather to be rougher? You want, um, you want it to be even bigger of a fragrance because this is a very, like I said, that's one of the most unique things about this is it walks that line between being so wearable and um, also, you know, having all of these amazing ingredients and features and, and benefits to the fragrance. So I think you have to kind of know your taste. For you, it may be the best fragrance of all time. For me, it's going to be one of these fragrances where I'll put it on the list, along with Tiger Lust, if I ever purchased full bottles of Ensar Oud, these would be the two. It would be Tiger Lust or EO number one, the original, not the Assam version, just EO number one. Um, so, that's my take. I uh, hope to see a lot of people in the comments that are familiar with EO number one, because I would love to see if you agree, disagree, love, hate my review. You know, I love the feedback. I love the interaction with you guys. That's one of the coolest things about, you know, uh, doing these videos is getting to interact. And I've always said it before that I learn more from you guys than you do from me. So please do leave a comment. Uh, likes and subscriptions, of course, always help the channel. But of course, you don't have to do that. But, um, you know, it does help with the YouTube algorithm and all that fun stuff. And so um, thank you very much for watching, everybody. Cheers, guys. And I'll catch you again next time. Bye-bye.